a very warm welcome from our side here from Schlotauer and Wauer to a new webcast. We are really happy that you joined us today. What will be the contents of today's session? Um, yeah, first of all, introduction, that is where we are now. Yeah, to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about today, I think um, that that's what we already had now. Um, then I, uh, yeah, we prepared uh, a short summary. What are common engineering tasks? What is What are tasks that all of us, that we are involved in the design of traffic lights, um, have to do on a day-to-day -day basis? Then um, approaches to traffic control. Um, here I um, try to identify the basic modes, the basic ways that you can, um, um, basic approaches that you can use to control signals, to control uh, traffic lights. And then this will be the main part, chapter four, factors influencing the design process. What decisions are we making when we are designing a traffic light or when we are designing an ITC, um, an, an ITS solution, both on the local level and on the network level. Um, then I will give um, an example in the end. Bogota project, if you are listening to this channel or watching our, um, our webcasts, you've probably heard of it in the, um, in the context of, of network control. Uh, and today we're going to talk about it a little bit broader, like um, what decisions have been made in this project? What were decisions that we had an influence on? What were decisions that we didn't have an influence, that we couldn't influence and that we had to deal with? And then at the end, I call this essentials, uh, maybe some kind of summary, like what could, should you take away from, uh, from us? What is our perspective on the design process, on the planning process? What are tools that we favor um, and what is what we would recommend? So common engineering tasks. This is really very basic. Um, the whole presentation will not go too much into detail. It's more of a philosophical approach, if you want to say so. So something that we can all agree on is that we have to take care of safety. If we're designing a traffic light, we have to identify conflicting traffic flows. We have to calculate intergreen times. We have to see what signals can go together, which cannot, and make sure that uh, we find the safest solution possible within the parameters that we are given. So safety, first column. Second, second task, capacity. Of course, we want everyone um, to get home safely, but uh, we're also asked to make sure that everybody gets home in time. So when we are looking at an intersection, we're also going to look at the volumes. We're also going to look at the demand that we're going to have to look uh, not only at the intergreen times, but also at the green times itself. Will the capacity be uh, tailored to our needs? And the third um, problem, maybe not something that we all have to deal with if we are only involved in designing intersections or in the planning process. We probably don't have to uh, think about operation, but uh, when we're on the perspective uh, of a city, of a municipality, or of, of, a, prov of a provider, uh, of mobility services, then we also have to think about how do our solutions uh, work in the field? How can we maintain them? Uh, how easy is it to change the parameters that we have put into our system? How can we react on on uh, on a changing demands or a changing city? How easy is it to fix any problems? So safety, capacity, and operation, these are tasks. These are things that we have to deal with. On the other hand, how can we approach the control of a single intersection? When we really look at the intersection, if we look at traffic lights, um, how can we control them? And we will find uh, that there are, at least from my perspective, um, four basic ways of controlling an intersection. The first would be fixed time. I have uh, fixed timings for my individual signals, be it in a certain program, but maybe also fixed times when I change between different programs. What you see in the background is a fixed timing plan that I find somewhere on our server. This was still done with pen and paper, probably uh, from the beginning of the 90s. In the foreground, you see, you see a single timing plan made with Lisa. So fixed time, I don't think I have to explain it. Something that you will find all over the world. Second idea, 
local traffic actuated with a standardized control scheme. Standardized controls can be found either in environments where you have um, a certain controller type that comes with a built-in uh, control scheme where you say this controller can do a certain type of traffic actuated control and it's limited to certain parameters. Found the, you found uh, such uh, standardized local traffic actuated uh, in the east of Germany in the eight and the uh, 1980s, for example, you uh, will still find, you could say that a certain flavor um, of that can be found in NEMA uh, controllers or in NTCIP controllers that are implementing certain standard functions of, of local traffic actuated. Uh, but also, this also encompasses um, standard uh, controls like inflow, um, you could also say that BS plus um, Swiss standard control scheme, um, stuff like that. But it's always based on a certain set of functionalities that are run by parameters. Then we have local traffic actuated a custom solution. Uh, this is what you will find in Germany, uh, Austria, Switzerland, mostly. Um, my two examples here. I will go in more into detail what I'm meaning with these pictures because we will talk about uh, control algorithms again in the second chat in the next chapter. So, um, customized traffic actuated controls, basically um, controls that have been tailor made for a certain uh, controller or for a certain intersection. Uh, then we have central adaptive controls all kinds of controls that are basically uh, situated in the central where the controller is merely uh, executing commands or even the, activa the activation of, of certain stages controlled by the by the central. This can work in different ways and, and different central adaptive approaches um, draw the line at a different point what how much functionality remains in the in the local controller but we will come to that. Um, so we've established certain tasks that we have to comply and we have established that we, there are different control types that we can use. Um, so how do we decide uh, for certain tools? How do we decide uh, what is the best approach for um, an individual intersection or in a project that, um, that we're tasked with? And now we come to the Main part of our presentation, factors influencing the design process. Um, you can argue with me if the factors that I put here are uh, comprehensive or if there's something missing. I'm sure there's something missing if we uh, if, if we talk about it um, uh, for a little or if we think about it a bit more. But this is um, these are the factors that came to my mind or from my my perspective that that uh, are most most influential to the decisions that we are making when uh, when we are consulting a certain uh, a client or stuff like that. So first of all, there's the controller. Which controller type am I using? What is the controller capable of? We'll come to all these points in detail. So there will be sub chapters for each of these uh, influencing factors. So uh, never mind if you don't if you don't understand right now what I what I want to talk about. Uh, we'll come to that in detail. So uh, control of safety measures, um, what kind of safety measures um, does the controller need or what kind of safety measures does, um, are we legally obliged to use? Um, and we have uh, as a factor central components, what kind of central do we have? What is the central capable of? Um, what can we, what technology can we rely on to, um, to either, uh, monitor the operation or even to even oversee our uh, our success. Um, all of this leads into interfaces. What interfaces are uh, available? You will always find this in, in a tender that uh, that a certain interface will be, uh, be for for central central to central communication or central to outstation communication will be favored. So um, what consequences may that have? Um, and algorithms, this is basically the part that we already talked about, like fixed time, traffic actuated, um, central adaptive. We would just talk about a bit more in detail what certain 
uh, algorithms apply because of course there are interdependencies between all these factors like if you rule out a certain controller you will rule out certain algorithms and vice versa um, and this is true for for everything that we see in this this picture and we will try to talk about all these dependencies um, tool support what am i using uh, what tools am i using and uh, what do these tools enable me to do um, Will I do my calculations in Excel? Um, do what capacity calculations can I do? Do I have to rely on a certain uh, capacity manual or not? Um, what is the client's um, or what is my own expect expectation to, um, to to what can I uh, what can I expect? Um, or what is my expectations towards quality or level of service? Uh, can I simulate stuff or not? How do my tools um, interoperate with one another? Um, coordination can be a factor. Do I have coordinated corridors um, that influences the way that I can plan individual intersections? Do I have to deal with traffic transport? Do I want to prioritize it? What kind of detection am I using? Um, and then another chapter, CITS functions. Uh, although they are still seem uh, like a thing of the future, we are already in the in a in a period of um, first implementations of pilot projects of CITS solutions, and uh, we have to be prepared. And uh, we should have that in mind that um, solutions that right now are not possible yet will be in five years or will be standard in five years, and we don't want to be in a place where. Um, we are not able to implement them anymore because we didn't have them. Uh, yeah, we, we didn't have them in mind when we designed our systems. OK, to go a bit, little bit more in detail into all these points, um, controller. Uh, controller capabilities define the possible control modes and algorithms. So uh, this picture here, I uh, took liberty to download it from a website that specializes in old controllers. And what you see up here, uh, it's a little, I call it a drum or something. And um, it has uh, it has certain lanes on it for the um, for the green time of individual, individual signal groups. So this little barrel here is rotating and it will activate uh, it, it will activate uh, signals depending on whether there is uh, whether certain pins are set on this drum. So, um, in consequence, this controller can only do fixed time because it has no uh, no microprocessor at all. Everything in here is just uh, electromechanical. So it's just an extreme an extreme example. Nowadays, we're more talking about differences in how many inputs and outputs can a controller do, how many definable stages do I have, how many definable programs, and most importantly, what supported interfaces can the controller do? So supported interfaces may have implications on compatible central solutions and components as well as the supported configuration tool. So some controllers are only have proprietary tools to, to supply them. Some may uh, support uh, data supply online or or not and um, yeah depending on that only by choosing a certain controller you might roll out certain solutions safety measures um, all controllers use some sort of safety mechanism that prevents conflicting signals to show green at the same time i think that is that is clear that is something that we will find all over the world um, although the names uh, for this, our use that are used a bit different. So, what are what is actually the the smallest element that I will uh, that I will have to find conflicts for uh, in the OCIT world? It's a signal group. Uh, in NTCIP, it's a phase or a movement. Like the movement is actually the smallest possible element, but a phase can also be a movement. So that's not really clear. And sometimes you should see that it's called phase. I saw that in Canada with it that in in the middle so but what we end up in the end is just we just uh yeah we have conflicts between signal groups in a matrix usually and then we have to fill this matrix or make a second matrix with intergreen times or these conflicts intergreen times must be defined so 
they're usually calculated based on the distances between the stop line and the conflict area. So there is a, an entering vehicle and a, and a clearing vehicle, and there will be some kind of calculation based on these distances, but not everywhere. There are still some countries that um, just rely on standard intervene times. They say, okay, if we have a four leg intersection with three lanes in one direction and four lanes in the other, then you're going to operate with a standard green time of, I don't know, X seconds. Well, that's the big um, exception. So what you want to have, you want to have an automated tool that can help you calculate these um, these distances and and measure them and and make a make a calculation based on the on the guidelines. So Lisa, for example, is a tool that that implements uh, such a functionality, and we have guidelines implemented for uh, for Germany, for Austria, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Poland. We recently got the authorization uh, from the uh, Ministry of Transport of Israel, which they are pretty strict in what they uh, allow or not, and uh, so. So there's that. Yeah, on a different note, um, NTCIP, for example, goes as far as they do not only put this this safety on the controller level, or or this is not the only safety measure, because NTCIP is always working in this uh, standard dual ring ring barrier system. You will find something like this in the basic controller configuration, where you define certain stages that can go with one another or movements and you have to define where certain barriers are and uh, how this works. Um, and if you've ever seen it, so basically there are two barriers where it's defined that um, these two rings usually can move individually. So ring one could move from movement one to movement two and then ring two can move at any point from five to six, but they both have to move over this barrier at the same time. So three and seven will always start at the same time and two and six will end at the same time. But the one and two and five and six can can be changed individually. So it is based on the fact that uh, most of the intersections uh, in North America are four like the intersections and they look the same and they therefore use the same control schemes. Um, the problem is as soon as you have something like this, where you have uh, more than four legs, um, you need to make it fit into the system by some way. In this case, the solution is to introduce another barrier here and to put this stream of the fifth leg into this, to, to bring it together with movement eight. Um, it works, but you are limited to the same stage sequence. Interfaces. Um, I've talked a lot about interfaces here. Just some uh, some examples. Um, I would not, I would never uh, <laughs> want to be given the task to to comprehensively show all the interfaces in system. So these are just some controller interfaces. We're not even talking about central to central interfaces. So um, we just talked about NEMA compliant. Uh, uh, controllers so they are implementing this dual ring barrier system and anti-CIP so they need to have some way to define rings and to define barriers otherwise it's not a NEMA compliant uh, controller. UK compliant uh, the UK has a certain certain standard um, where you are where the controller needs to take control bits and also send back reply bits where it's stages are being activated and then the controller is confirming that it, it has activated a certain stage. Yeah, so the controller itself doesn't have a lot of a lot of uh, um, intelligence, but it has on the upside, it has um, a real time or almost real time interface with the central. Whereas OCIT, uh, the German or a DACH like Germany, Switzerland, Austria solution is not really saying anything about the control that is in the controller it's apart from fixed time saying something. It can implement a logic that is usually based on stages, um, but that is not really dependent on the, not really inherent in the, uh, um, in the standard itself. You might still find proprietary implementation if you go to a market, I don't know, uh, where there is uh, 
where these standards are not not uh, not asked for yet, you find uh, maybe someone who's was who's building his own controller uh, since years. Maybe it has some is um, meeting some international uh, standards. Yeah, have safe electronics in it and stuff like that. But in that case, you will need someone who is capable of implementing a proprietary uh, or implementing a traffic actuated control in there. Uh, this has basically proprietary implementation. This has basically been the situation before OCIT uh, introduced in Germany. So yeah, open interfaces allow the installation of hardware from different manufacturers. On the other hand, specific use cases or the existing expertise in more closed environments may favor other solutions. So if you come to a city where everybody knows knows how to work with Scoot, um, it's probably hard to um, to make everyone change to OCIT and vice versa. Also, you should never forget the sunken cost in certain controllers. We talked about that the fact that certain controllers imply that you use a certain interface. So the ch a change to a different interface would mean that you would deem all these controllers useless from one day to another. A short chapter, not really, which also may influence decisions on the local level. What central components do we have? So what you would always expect from a central is that it does operation and failure management. It should take care that all the intersections are online and uh, also monitor which program is running. Also here we have the, the question, what is better, having open interfaces for the central components or having integrated functions? Um, so if you look at the manufacturers of central solutions, most of the tools will work best if you buy everything out of one hand because then their tools can interoperate a little better and um, you will see that the way that that products are um, are developed is that you always say okay I will make it protocol compliant on one hand but I also will put some features in here that go uh, beyond that my city I think it's yeah the Swarco solution is not different in that regard um, it is built around the idea that you can have your own ecosystem and you don't have to throw away your existing solutions. But of course, there is always something that when you have the development of all tools in your own hand that you can make possible, that is just impossible with, with, a, with a common standard interface. So, and the rest of the list is just, yeah, um, just examples of things that you might want to have in your central, like environmental detector as a strategy manager. Uh, you want to have, be it treat as compliant. So is it critical infrastructure? It has to meet certain uh, security, uh, um, certain security uh, standards, stuff like that. Should it be real time or not? Shall it have a traffic simulator implemented? The list could go on and on. But what you take away from this, um, you probably don't need all of this. So what you need then is a modular solution. So if you're not really a fan of, uh, or not in need for envi environmental detection, uh, that should not rule out the whole thing just because you don't want component. Okay, we're coming back to algorithms, something we took a look at at the beginning in the introduction. When we talk about different algorithms, so we have fixed time control. You might say, okay, fixed time, this is something that we have since since the beginning of traffic lights. It is not something that we should rule out from the get-go. It Fixed time uh, plannings are still a proper solution for, uh, for a big part of intersections when you take a closer look at them. You don't always have to need the, op the need to optimize uh, every last second in every hour of the day or sometimes you will just have so stable such stable conditions that you know it does it's just not worth the effort every time to make a traffic actuated control also you might find yourself in situations or in uh, in a financial environment where it's not an option to uh, to buy cameras for every intersection so what we need to know is when fixed time is a viable solution and uh, what are the disadvantages of it so we can all make an educated decision of when to use it. So um, that is what 
also what we're trying to do here with all the other control algorithms. There is not the one solution that fits all. Um, that is the takeaway here. So yeah, basic function of any hardware solution. The good thing is you can always implement it. You don't have to think about does my controller actually support it? If it doesn't support fixed time, then I would start asking questions. It can perform similar to a traffic actuated control when we have a stable condition and we have saturated because in saturated conditions every traffic actuated will also lead to a fixed time control but of course we have the problem there's unused green when we're off the peak hour the performance is diminishing if the control is not updated regularly so as a rule of thumb you can say that traffic conditions or volumes at a certain intersection will differ about will change about five percent every year sometimes more, sometimes less, maybe not always in the same direction, but uh, something that is an optimal control today will not be as optimal in 12 months anymore. And also, yeah, it's depending on the profound capacity calculation. So how have we come to these green times? Have we just uh, made a guess or did we have some kind of capacity manual in the background? Um, where does that come from? Did we do it ourselves? Did we do it with an old Excel table that a colleague gave us some years ago, or do we have a tool that can do that? When we come to traffic actuated, I already mentioned that before. Uh, standard algorithms or standard controls that are just parametrized or just run with, with different parameters, um, they're also a common solution. They have uh, the, the upshot is um, you have a certain way of parametrizing uh, your control that you can use over and over again. And if you have similar uh, intersections, you might even be able to copy the control of one intersection to the next. Also, when you know what, um, what a standard algorithm is good at, and they all have different characteristics, you know, okay, this is a perfect intersection for standard algorithm X, or it might be perfect for a standard algorithm Y, where it usually gets a bit tricky. Certain cities say, okay, we found our our standard algorithm and we want to use that for all intersections. Um, the problem that you might run into is that all standard algorithms have their sweet spot, so to say. They have their their intersection type where they work best, where they're perfect, and you don't have to do a lot of adjustments because they were designed specifically with such, a, such an intersection in mind. And as soon as you have something that is either, I don't know, could be too complex for the for this algorithm, or it could even be so easy that the number of, 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 uh, of parameters that you have to put in just to make it work for a single, I don't know, pedestrian intersection could be much, much more complicated than just writing, writing a new logic for it. This is not about the best solution is this. It's just about uh, understanding what is, yeah, what, what is the best, best issue in our, uh, in, in our, uh, in our situation. Yeah. And I put the, uh, put the inflow logo here because, uh, yeah, that is the a standard algorithm that we are offering. Traffic actuated, custom algorithm, uh, and especially a custom algorithm, how they were done in Germany, they were done like that like 20 years ago, but I think there's still some, some manufacturers still do it like that in some regions of the world, that as soon as you have a traffic actuated control, that it has to be done by um, a software developer. So we will have an engineer working together with a software developer. The engineer will tell him what to do, may define the parameters of the control, whether very strict, uh, already very detailed, or just very broad. Um, that was the practice of uh, designing these flowcharts and handing them over to a software developer. There was also the practice of just, um, yeah, verbally describing what the intersection is supposed to do. Uh, the upside, anyways, you will have tailored solutions for any level of complexity. If you have a good engineer and a good developer, you can tackle any problem, uh, no matter how complex. Uh, it will only be limited by what the controller can do. On the other hand, individual solutions for intersections may be very costly. 
Uh, also, the question here is who is responsible for debugging? Maybe the engineer has made a mistake in, in the way that he designed this this concept or the developer has made a con has made a, a mistake in, in realizing it. So there is always the question of who's responsible for debugging. The same thing in the Lisa world, traffic actuated custom algorithm, but developed in Lisa or could also be developed in yeah, in C traffic office, of course, but uh, won't talk about that. <laughs> so you still have custom code, but you have custom code that was was made from a standard library of controller functions. It was de designed in an assisted tool uh, with a flow dia diagram, and the th and the concept that the engineer is doing at the same time as the code that he's developing. So he's both. Uh, uh, or she is both uh, uh, responsible for for developing and debugging and testing. So it means more responsibility for the engineer. And if we have new controller functions, they must be integrated in the library first. So if we talk about CITS, we're right now we're talking about extending the library of the of the Lisa functions. Yeah, but uh, still, you are only the complexity basically is only limited by the computing power of the of the controller. Last algorithm hype that we talked that I want to talk about central adaptive standardized network control algorithms. They run on central hardware. The network control adds network perspective beyond the information available to a single controller. You have you're minimizing unused green in all situations or at least you're trying to you will always find a cycle time that is uh, close to the optimum. Yeah, the limiting factor here is you usually need more detection, so it could be more costly to to um, to implement that in a certain area. Uh, and this always includes an extra calibration process. You don't only have to see that your control is fitting with the individual intersection. You also have to see that the that the um, that the adaptive control is also working within within the parameters that you expect. So different approaches. My city adaptive versus Scoot, for example, uh, adaptive systems differ in response time, level of local integration, the traffic model, and compatible controllers. So, in the case of Scoot, Scoot is responding every four seconds to the current situation, but that is also due to the fact that the local controller is just receiving stage activation commands and saying, "Okay, I've activate, activated stage X," whereas in the my city approach it or enus or my city adaptive approach would be that the local controller is working with any of the control schemes that we talked about before it might be a fixed time com control or traffic actuated or some control uh, control algorithm uh, but it runs in a certain program and with certain parameters, and these parameters are forwarded from the my city server via the central to the controller, and vice versa. But the controller, in the end, is doing the the heavy lifting, so to say, the, the calculations from second to second. Yeah, software tools support traffic engineers in different tasks: intergreen time calculation, capacity calculation, simulation, quality analysis monitoring of traffic, strategy management. Of course, this would not be a Schlotauer presentation if I would not speak of Lisa. Lisa is basically integrating most of these tasks. You can do software-based green time calculation. You can do capacity calculations. Um, you can do an even automated uh, signal timing plan calculations. You can look at coordinations. Um, you can develop your own traffic actuated control in here. You can even simulate or you can interface with a better simulation tool like Visim and you can upload the control directly to the controller. So Lisa is a tool that is doing, I'd say, 80% of the jobs that I put up here. Uh, of course, it's not a central tool. So if you want to see what how your control performs, you still need a central. You still need a quality analysis tool. Uh, but you could use my city analytics for that, and you would have an integration that Lisa would already export some parameters for that. So there we are again at the point where interoperation between different tools, of course, is easier when you stay within the same ecosystem. But you can also use it to design for um, for Siemens controllers so, and so on and so on. So it doesn't have to be a Swarco branded controller. That is not what 
DISA was designed in. Uh, in Even if you just want to do capacity calculations, maybe you're still using Excel or other um, softwares um, to do some or all of the tasks that, that we're doing here. Um, I think through the level of integration and, and, and shared data, I think Lisa is doing a very good job. Most of these tools, uh, most of these jobs. Coordinated corridors require the design of several intersections in parallel, so it's also something you can do on Lisa. You can open several controllers at the same time and see how do they look like in this time distance diagram. That is one part of it. How do I design them? Then there's always the question of how do I optimize the offset? There are different approaches, of course, like in all these chapters. You have online versus offline. Lisa, for example, would be an offline tool. You would um, optimize a certain set of offsets for a given volume. And there's the, when you do online optimization, like in a adaptive control, like Inflow or Scoot, you would go ahead and see, um, uh, you would see second to second optimizations, of course. So that it would be based on current detector volumes um, and not on counts uh, that were made before. Yeah, also here part of control algorithm or in the planning process in Lisa would be part of the planning process, giving a making doing a given or a defining a coordination for a certain program. And also uh, important intersection by intersection or network network wide. Most online algorithms that do offsite optimization usually look at the uh, look at the offset between two intersections and they optimize it and then they go to the next two intersections and then to the next two intersections and you can define a certain corridor by putting priority on certain directions within a network but it will be a step-by-step -step, uh, iteration whereas in lisa you can do coordinations over the whole coordinated corridor and it will find uh, or try to find an optimum uh, taking into account the offsets of all intersections within that corridor. And also you can say, I want to favor a certain direction or I want to look for a network optimum uh, for both directions. So this last sentence, solutions are usually local optimum. You always have to keep in mind, this is an exponentially growing mathematical problem. So the more intersections you have, um, the, the number of solutions will grow exponentially. So we're never finding the the general optimum, the best solution that exists, we're finding one that is potentially the best. Uh, and by trying a lot of solutions, there is a high probability that it is the best solution, but you can never be sure because it is impossible to calculate all possibilities. Public transport, how it usually works, public transport priority can be realized with different technologies. Most common is a combination of GPS technology and radio transmission. So depending on the position of the of the vehicle on its trajectory, it will send it will send a signal or a radio message saying uh, I'm vehicle A um, on line X and I'm on position Y or as I said here line A at position X, and this radio message is transmitted and then it is either received by an individual controller and the controller will prioritize this vehicle, or it is received by the central and the central is responsible for the prioritization of the of the individual uh, uh, vehicle that depends on the solution that you have implemented but the uh, the underlying principle is always that it will give its position at one point on the tra trajectory and that is all the information that you're getting in the future we will see that the new CITS protocols vehicle to X communication will probably, this will probably be the first implementation for these new solutions. So in the future, a vehicle will give away its position permanently. It will also receive information from the intersection. The intersection will tell it uh, on, which, on which lane it is and so on. And the vehicle itself will be able to calculate, based on this information, uh, an estimated arrival time. So the intersection is telling the vehicle, hey, my position is here and there, and you are 
and, and the stop line is at, at this at this position. So the vehicle can calculate, OK, uh, with my current speed, I will probably arrive at uh, 742 and 11 seconds. And whenever this estimation changes because it's slowing down or it's speeding up, it will update this estimated arrival time. So um, and also this information, and that is where we're still we're still not really clear how it's going to work. Um, there is a possibility that the channel will be directly to the controller because um, there is a there is a standard for that, but it could also be that the information is first transmitted to a cloud or to the central and then uh, then going back to the to the controller. This will depend on yeah how cities uh, and how mobility providers are uh, create, are designing their tenders uh, now and in the future. Detection is a key element for both local and central level controls. Different control algorithms lead to different requirements for the number of detectors, positioning of detectors, or the measured data and detector type. This is also something that is true vice versa. Um, so if you have existing detectors, then at this point, external factors that determine detector choice and therefore the possible control algorithms are cost of certain detector types, sunken cost in existing detectors, expected reliability or possibility to maintain hardware. Um, it can be both ways. You can start with uh, someone having a certain control algorithm in mind and then just position the detectors because cost is not a factor or it could be the other way around that you have existing detectors or the need to use a certain type of detector and then you have to uh, look at um, what control algorithms are best suited for this. So this is an example um, how just within ENIS or within my city adaptive you have different levels of control uh, that you will have. Um, the above solution would be I have local fixed time controllers and I'd only want to have an idea about the a uh, general level of of uh, or general demand in the area, whereas below I uh, to to do um, plan selection, whereas below I do plan selection and I also want traffic actuated at the individual intersections, which would mean lean, lead to more detectors needed. So it depends on the the control that you want to have. So some need more detectors, some less, and they also prefer different positions of detectors. For example, here what would be the optimal positioning just for local traffic actuated. We usually, in Germany at least, we usually prefer 40 meters to the stopping line. That would mean we could gap out after three seconds, and after these three seconds, the vehicle is exactly at the stop line. Whereas if we're looking at um, Enos um, or My City Adaptive and we want to put a strategic detector, we would position it somewhere outside of the normal queue. Uh, but inside the congested queue, and this also happens to be the perfect position for a scoot detector, so which is totally different to this use case. CITS, um, I've mentioned it when we talked about public transport. Um, CITS will change the way we design controls. CITS functions enable new use cases. M messages enable new ways of detection and map and spat open new communication channel from the controller to the user. So um, CAM is the, is the awareness message that the that the vehicle is sending and MAP and SPAT are the information that the intersection is giving about this topology and about the signal plan and timing. Public transport priority will benefit from more accurate arrival estimations. This is how, how uh, CAM messages could be used as detectors or how they could replace detectors. So right now we have demand detectors either in at the stop line or these detectors in 40 meters distance to the stop line. And that means that we always have a certain time that we lose because the demand is coming at a certain point, but we always need, we need nine seconds in this case to change to the, to the demanded stage. Whereas if we have a demand given by a vehicle that is, uh, that, that is giving this via radio message like a public transport vehicle would do, we can change to that, that stage without losing any time. So the idea, idea is basically to implement principles that we know from, from public transport priority to uh, individual, um, individual vehicles. Yeah, one thing that we developed to fill a certain data field in these uh, SPET messages or signal plan and timing messages, um, there is a field in these messages where you can 
do a prognosis saying, OK, uh, a signal will turn to green in five seconds or six seconds. And there are different solutions that exist for that. And one of them is um, would be uh, calculating this in the cloud based on uh, based on green times in the past. The solution that we are offering here is a solution that has the information from inside the controller, which um, which leads to a much more uh, precise and much more reliable prognosis because it has more information than than just um, a cloud based. So um, I just want to give you a practical example on how these decision making worked in a project in an actual project. Um, this was project of Bogota. So what was the scope of this project? What were the challenges? What was the result and how does it inter uh, combined with what I just explained. Bogota population of 7.4 million. I think this is not the actual number anymore uh, because the city is growing very fast. Um, at the beginning, we had 1500 signalized intersections. Most hours spent in traffic jams in the world in 2019, 191 hours public transport exclusively handled with buses. So um, everybody's nightmare. The challenges were expectations from the client were about that we would have 30% improvement in travel times. Local controls should be planned individually. Video detectors had to be used, but maybe we can come to that more in detail on the next slide. So when we look at these 10 factors, where did we have decisions to make? Where did we have already made decisions? So the controllers were Actros and C900 controllers with an OCIT C interface. So that was due just due to the consortium that we formed together with Siemens. It was requirement that we re recalculate all the intergreen times at all intersections. The central components were Scala Central and an Enos network control. Interface was OCITC. The algorithms, this is something that was part of the design process with local custom controls, traffic actuated and fixed time, and uh, with an Enos Central adaptive system. The tools that were used for the planning were LISA, ENES, C Traffic Office, and also VISIM for simulations. Selected corridors were, were, were coordinated, and we used some online optimization um, in, within the algorithm. Some intersections had uh, locally implemented bus priority. Um, we were using video detection that was also um, determined before the the project began and CITS functions were not available of course because they were still a thing of the future so the main part of all these decisions here were made in the tender phase mostly coming from the fact that Swarco and Siemens were teaming up to get this uh, to to be in the tender then also some some of them were already in the tender so the main decision that had to be made was what kind of control algorithm will we use at what intersection? And also what detection would we use where? Because it was clear that it was video detection and it was also clear that we had only a certain number of detectors. So the big design decision here was what control algorithm or what level of control will we use at one intersection? We used, uh, we ran some of them in fixed time. We ran some of them in traffic actuated, some of them in traffic actuated plus central adaptive, and some of them in automated plan selection and whatever whatever the control was was um, at the at the at the local level. So how did we get to the decision? We were looking at each and every individual intersection. We looked if it was at if it was part of a coordinated corridor. We took a look at the levels of saturation. We took a look at if there was sufficient dynamics in the traffic during the day to actually justify the installation of detectors. So that's what we what we did in the design phase. Then also we learned a bit about detectors and how, and how to install them, that video detectors need to be treated a bit differently so they can count um, reliably. And in the end, we did an evaluation and the results were actually pretty positive. Um, we had an average gain of 7% in uh, travel time in uh, adaptive corridors um, and we had a loss time reduction between 5 and 19% depending on which part of the city you look at. 
So the results were at big improvements for pedestrians uh, in off-peak hours, lost time reduction in coordinated corridors, as I said, between 10 and 20%, journey time 7%, and so on. Oh, and also 30% less hours spent in traffic, but this was due to COVID-19. Anyways, to wrap it up, essentially, the our perspective on what a modern ITS system should be based on is that it should be flexible, modular, and easily extendable architecture. The key idea is that technology must fit to the task at hand. Uh, it should avoid to be overly complex if it's just a simple problem. So if you have an intersection that is fixed, that looks like fixed time, then make it fixed time. You don't have to always follow the same design rules, um, follow that, that solution that, that fits the problem. On the other end, Technology should be scalable. Modular solutions can grow with their cities. So this also means open interfaces can make sure that different problems can be handled with the appropriate solution. Maybe the solution is not a Swarco solution, even if it hurts, then the client should still be able to use that solution. Yeah, and software tools can provide support at any level of traffic control, safety, capacity, and operation. And yeah, current solutions should be extendable with CITS functions. Yeah, and we think that our products and services can support you at any level of your design process, no matter how complex. Maybe automated green time calculations is also is already a leap forward to you. If you are still doing this with pen and paper, then uh, maybe have a look at Lisa. The same goes for capacity calculation. What about the designing of fixed time controls? So, and what we've also learned, and this is the next uh, slide. What usually was the feedback towards Lisa, especially, was it's a very capable tool, but it was for some of our clients too expensive for their task at hand. So this lesson that we learn that sometimes you don't need the full functionality to actually improve something led to us restructuring the prices of Lisa and restructuring Lisa to these three different packages. Lisa S, where you can do basic data like uh, intergreen time calculation, you can calculate signal timing plans, and then you have Lisa M, where you can do coordination, you have Lisa XL, where you can do traffic actuated control, public transport, and testing, and so on. And then we have several optional modules that can go with any of these packages like traffic counts or export to VISIM, map export for roadside units, so the CITS capability and yeah, CITS functions, so implementing certain CITS functions directly into the logic. That is about it. Just a little reminder, these are all Schlotauer and Bauer or very close with Schlotauer developed products, Lisa, Inflow, Enus, Spotmaker, my city more on the Swarco side, of course. Enus, for those of you who know Enus or uh, know it for a while, will be rebranded to My City Adaptive, supported also within My City, but still as a standalone tool. So just that you've heard it from us and not from somebody else. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And as always, we are at your service if you have further questions. Please contact us at service at schlotower.de if you have any technical questions or if you want a quote, an offer, have uh, any sales related questions, then please contact us at lisa at schlotower.de. Thanks and have a nice day.